So we've got health care now. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about why, at least partially, and it relates to Two Kingdoms Theology on the Gary DeMar Show. Hello, welcome to the Gary DeMar Show. Once again, I'm Joel McDermott, your host today, filling in for Gary DeMar. I'd like to talk a bit about a few things pertaining to uh, why we have a welfare state, of which health care is just a small portion. Uh, it's just the latest uh, brick stacked onto the wall of welfare. And uh, why does this prevail in society, particularly in American society, which is supposed to be the land of the uh, uh, home of the brave, land of the free. I got it backwards, land of the brave, home of the free. Um, but um, uh, how could this happen? In a mere century or a little bit more, our country went from being uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, and really maybe even less than that, maybe half a century, uh, went from being pull yourself up by your bootstraps to being uh, let the government raise you from the cradle to the grave and make sure that there's always a safety net in case you fall so that you never have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You're always uh, um, cradled in the arms of government, so to speak. Uh, well, a, a lot of it has to do with immigration, and a lot of it has to do with the religion that immigrants have brought, and of course that spreads and, and things change over time and people become more amenable to being given handouts, and this immigration is not everything, but in the late 19th century, early 20th century, we had a huge influx of Lutheran immigrants from Scandinavian countries, came in the north central part of the United States, they dominate Minnesota, uh, part of upper Michigan, um, Wisconsin, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, etc. They still have prevalence. Uh, it was out of that movement that a lot of the labor and, and unionizing type uh, farm movements and farm subsidies uh, huge democratic, not democratic, but democrat party movements, or at least they would become that. Uh, people whose, whose main platforms were government subsidies to help the people. And uh, it just took over because people like government handouts. Uh, I'm accusing uh, the Lutheran theology because it is primarily Lutheran theology out of which we get the two kingdoms theology. And yeah, of course I know you could say it goes back to Augustine and his, his view of the two kingdoms the two cities, and that that filtered through medieval theology and Luther just picked it up. But it was Luther that made it uh, very powerful and prevalent throughout Protestantism, especially among the magisterial reformers who differed on the law in some cases and, and applications of civil law, but all basically held a two kingdoms view. Uh, it, is, it is an outgrowth, it is a vestige of Platonism, which carries a dual mentality. You've got the heavenly realm over here, which is, you know, where all of God's stuff takes place, and then you've got the earthly realm down here, which is earthly, corrupt, uh, coercion, anything that has to do with, um, with, you know, just getting things done. Well, that's it's secondary. It can't be holy, and we tolerate it until the day comes that God makes us holy and draws us up into this heavenly realm. And, of course, that's a bit of a character, but it happens. Uh, that is the outgrowth of Platonism in Christian uh, thought and practice. Uh, during the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages and early modern era, right before the Reformation, in fact for about a century leading up to that, there were constant uprisings among the peasants in those lands because they were constantly being, uh, how should we say, they were constantly being uh, extorted by the princes and nobles and the church was on the side of the princes and nobles who paid their tithes. So this, the nobles went and extracted rents and, and took over lands that weren't theirs previously from the peasants. And they made things harder and harder for peasants and peasant life. And, um, and then, of course, they paid their tithes and their rents to the church. And so the church was always on the side of the nobles who paid the money. Uh, I shouldn't say always. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, where Reformation takes place, and the peasants see a tremendous opportunity here to reform society. But 
the, at least in Germany anyway, the main exponent of the Reformation was Luther, and he sides with the nobles, and he develops a theology called Two Kingdoms Theology, in which everything pertaining to God is in one sphere, and everything pertaining to earthly life is in the other sphere, and it is secondary, and it is not governed by divine law. It is governed by what he calls the laws of nature, uh, which, by the way, as far as I know, he never defined in his 57 volumes of works. Uh, so you get to this system. Uh, the peasants, meanwhile, the other outgrowth of the Reformation is the Bible begins to be translated in the language of the people. It begins to circulate among the people. They, for the first time in their lives, begin to read and to hear the laws of Moses. And they realize, wait a minute, there are supposed to be laws to help the poor people. There are supposed to be laws against oppression. There are supposed to be prosecutions when people are extorted and, 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 and fraudulently uh, robbed and cheated through schemes of government. They start reading the prophets and they realize the prophets are constantly harping on the rich because not because they don't have welfare programs in place, not because they're not taxing and spending, but because they're not living up to their Christian obligations to allow these people uh, to have freedom, uh, to have just weights and measures, to have uh, just hearings in courts. Uh, meanwhile, the princes are still expanding their powers. They begin to take over lands that were uh, previously held to be common lands. Uh, not that that's necessarily a biblical concept, but the, the tradition had it that the people were allowed to hunt and fish on common lands, that they were allowed to cut timber and, and make tools of wood and things like that on their common lands and heat their homes with the wood. And as these princes and nobles and lords and cities begin to expand their borders, basically by human fiat, they, uh, they encroach on these things. You get 1524, just a few years after Luther's Diet of Worms, and, you know, and the Reformation's in full swing, and these people are applying the laws of Moses, and they're calling out for property rights, and they're going to these nobles, and they present the 12 articles uh, of the peasants in 1524, and it says, we just want to be able to hunt again. We just want to be able to fish again. We're sick and tired of being taxed to death by the state. We are sick and tired of being overrun by princes and lords, being made slaves who say we can't leave this land and go to a freer land even if we want to. Uh, we're sick and tired of paying tithes that go to support a church that's living a lavish lifestyle and wearing golden uh, gilded shirts and vestments. Uh, while we're down here, we can't even feed ourselves. We're not even allowed to cut wood to heat our homes. Okay, we're sick of this. And they say, and, and we're, we're not going to put up with it anymore. And, and of course, the, the, they won't hear them. And, of course, you have a revolt. And they have the peasants' revolt. And so Luther, uh, who at one point was saying, yeah, maybe the rich need to, to give way to these, noble, to these uh, peasants, uh, immediately goes back to his his uh, home and, and publishes his pamphlet against the murderous hordes because of the revolt. They're tearing down uh, houses, they're tearing down castles, they're burning chapels, etc., etc. Uh, it was all because, but Luther had justified what the, what the nobles were doing by saying the gospel does not speak to any of that. Okay, the gospel does not pertain to peasant life. It does not pertain to commerce. It does not pertain to property rights. You can't use the Bible to justify how the reform of civil law. And it was for that reason that the nobles sat back and felt justified in what they were doing. And it was for that reason that the peasants say, if you're not going to listen to us, we'll revolt. And there was a huge revolt. Okay, it was that very mindset, uh, basically the same mindset, who, come, who immigrate to the United States. Uh, and begin to fill the Northeast and the Midwest, etc. And, and what is the outcome of it here? Well, you have people who believe you cannot apply the laws of Moses to government, and yet you have a people who have it on their conscience that they need to help the poor. And nevertheless, since the Bible does not apply to government, government can make any laws it wants to, it goes out and starts designing a whole series of laws in which they tax uh, people and then give it to whom they deem as the poor or to, to finance what they see as these gigantic welfare programs. It was out of that very uh, Minnesota government and the so-called farm, I believe it was the Farm Labor Union Party or something like that, that a man named Hubert Humphreys came from. He was the Democratic majority whip in the Senate 
when Medicare was passed, and of course he was rewarded for his efforts there when Lyndon Johnson made him his vice president immediately following that. Well, we'd like to talk about this some more if we get a chance, but our time's running out today, so thank you for joining me on the Gary DeMar Show, and stick it to the two kingdoms, guys. This is their fault. Thank you. For more related to today's topic, check out Basic Training for Defending the Faith, a five-part video lecture series featuring Dr. Greg Bonson. You will find it at 